Good afternoon and welcome to the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us through our YouTube channel. I'm very pleased um, to be here with you to hear Joshua Hammer tell us about his new book, The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu and Their Race to Save the World's Most Precious Manuscripts. As a librarian, the title certainly resonated with me. <laughs> Before we go any further, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up here this week and next. On Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., New York Times columnist Tom Edsel will moderate a discussion with former members of Congress and Presidential Medal of Freedom winner Lee Hamilton related to his new book, Congress, Presidents, and American Politics, 50 Years of Writings and Reflections with Lee Hamilton. Joining the conversation will be Ray LaHood, former Secretary of Transportation, former member of Congress, and author of Seeking Bipartisanship, My Life in Politics. On Wednesday, May 4th at noon, we welcome back historian and author Anthony S. Pitch, who will discuss and sign his new book, The Last Lynching, How a Gruesome Mass Murder Rocked a Small Georgia Town. Drawing on some 10,000 previously classified documents from the FBI and the National Archives, the last lynching reveals the true story behind the last mass lynching in America, which occurred in rural Georgia in 1946. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online at archives.gov. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And you'll also find brochures about other Ar um, National Archives programs and activities. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership in the lobby. The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. Four years ago, Islamist extremists sweeping through Mali seized control of Timbuktu, a city with a long history of scholarship and once a major cultural and trade center. Abdel Kader Hydra, Kader, Kader, a historian and librarian who had for decades salvaged and collected ancient Islamic manuscripts, saw his life's work at the brink of destruction. Hydra, determined to save these precious manuscripts, many written during the golden age of Timbuktu in the 1500s when the city was in the intellectual center of the Islamic world. He organized a band of volunteers to clandestinely remove the documents and bring them to a place of safety. The story at this point becomes a thriller in the words of Jeffrey Brown in his review for the Washington Post. Brown further writes that the badass librarians of Timbuktu vividly captures the history and strangeness of this place in a fast-paced narrative that gets us behind today's headlines of war and terror. The work of Haidara and his band of brave volunteers speaks to all of us in the library and archival community, our calling to keep safe our shared cultural heritage of the written word doesn't often lead us into imminent danger as these Mali face, but we all take our roles as protectors very seriously. Saving treasures is what we do here at the National Archives, and our treasures are the na national memories that tell us who we are and how we got here. We're entrusted to safeguard the integrity of our documentary heritage now and far into the future. The story of the librarians of Timbuktu inspires us who work in this field and reinforces our dedication to our mission to preserve and make available the records in our charge. 
It's now my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Joshua Hammer, who was a bureau chief for Newsweek and correspondent at large on five continents. He's now a contributing editor to Smithsonian and Outside, and a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books. He's the author of three nonfiction books and has won numerous journalism awards. And after his talk and Q&A, he'll be signing copies of the book One Level Up Outside of the Archive Shop. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joshua Hammer. Can we get that projected? Can we get that projected on to the? Yeah, Tom's doing it right now. Hi. Uh, thank you. I've just been in. Oh, there we go. Um, just been out in Mountain View, California, speaking to seven people at Google. So this is. A, <laughs> it's a pleasure to come here and see some book lovers in, 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 a, in a nice turnout. Um, what I thought I would do is talk about the project and how I came to it and what the story is, give you a little bit of a sense of this very odd part of the world through some pictures that I took there. And then if there's time, and I think there should be, I've done a few of these already, read a couple of short uh, excerpts, very short excerpts. I know that that can be you know, somewhat tedious to have people drone on and on, but short uh, excerpts that'll give you a flavor for the story. So, um, how did I, why Timbuktu? Uh, in 1995, I was Newsweek's bureau chief in sub-Saharan Africa and had a kind of carte blanche at that time in the glory days of, of Newsweeklies to travel around the continent pretty much anywhere I wanted to go uh, and spend weeks on the road just exploring. And um, colleagues and I went to Mali and we landed in Timbuktu. We chartered a small plane. That's how you know, generous people were in those days. You could <laughs> charter your own plane. <laughs> and we went up to Timbuktu, but they weren't generous enough that we could kind of keep the plane overnight. We had to like get, you know, the meter was running, so we got a two-hour mad dash around this sandy, backwater, desolate place in the middle of, at the edge of the Sahara, and just enough time to kind of breathe in the atmosphere and see some of the houses where the 19th century explorers had, uh, had uh, pitched up uh, after crossing the Sahara. At least one of them had been captured and uh, unmasked as a non-Muslim and executed short time later. So this place was incredible. Was, although it was desolate, isolated, kind of depressing and dirty, it was, it was, you, it was redolent of this, of this past glory and it stayed with me. In uh, 2006, I left Newsweek. I became a freelance writer. Was scrambling to find work uh, in those early days of my freelance career, and stumbled across a small article, possibly in the New York Times. I can't even remember anymore. But it was about these manuscripts in Timbuktu, these medieval manuscripts that were being rediscovered. Uh, they had been lost, and now they were being rediscovered. Libraries were being built. There was kind of a renaissance going on in the in this city. Uh, so that really intrigued me, and I pitched it to an editor at Smithsonian Magazine. I was beginning to develop a relationship there. This was a perfect Smithsonian story. Within a week, I was on a plane to, um, to Timbuktu. And this is just a couple of, this is the saint Cloré Mosque, uh, which was um, at the center. This is kind of my first images of this place back then. Uh, these bizarre, this is kind of based, built, originally built in the 14th century out of mud. Based, somewhat influenced by the pyramids of Egypt, obviously somewhat lopsided and with its permanent scaffolding. I mean, Timbuktu was just filled with its weirdness. It was also a typical street in the oldest part of town, the saint Corre neighborhood. Uh, still a very desolate place for the most part. Um, all very monochromatic, these you know, sort of phantom figures wandering through the streets. Um, during that trip, I met this gentleman, Abdul Qadir Hydra who became my kind of guide into this world of manuscripts. Manuscripts, what? I didn't know anything about this. Uh, and as Hydra related this story to me, uh, I learned that in the, yeah, sure. I learned that in the, uh, sorry, that better. But uh, anyway, I learned that in the uh, 15th century, in 16th century, Timbuktu had been actually a glorious center of civilization. It was a major stop on trade routes coming from as far away as Europe, across camel caravans across the Sahara would meet boats coming up the Niger River, the third longest river in Africa. The trading uh, medium was gold. So incredible wealth in this city. Uh, in the 15th century, a couple of very 
um, tolerant, open-minded kings of what was then a, a great, great empire running along the Niger River turned Timbuktu into a center of learning. They invited scholars, they invited architects, poets to come to the city and also fostered a very lively manuscript trade. There were scribes who took Qurans, Hadith, other works, imported into Timbuktu, made copies of them, distributed them to libraries, did beautiful work. Um, this is some of the, the manuscripts. I'm just, I, I copied a few. This is actually runs, probably the best picture. This runs um, as an end paper in my book. I believe this is a Quran. So they were not just simply beautiful calligraphy, but they were like the medieval manuscripts of, 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 uh, of Europe. They involved gold leaf, wonderful patterns. Of course, uh, Islam prohibited human uh, representation, so they uh, resorted to these incredibly intricate and beautiful designs to stress harmony and beauty and essentially all uh, uh, um, obeisance to God uh, and celebration of God's works. Um, but this was, these were not just religious works. This is incredibly important details that although it began with Qurans and Hadiths, Timbuktu was a, 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 a place where Sufi Islam was practiced, moderate is a moderate form of Islam. It was very open to secular ideas. So over time you had, I believe this is a book that breaks down Arabic verse into its various components. You had books, I can't tell you what most of this stuff is because frankly almost none of it has been translated. There's been enough that we have some idea of what some, I mean, I would say probably 1% of the incredibly vast production of Timbuktu has actually been translated into English or any other language for that matter. But so you have this extraordinary art and extraordinary design and works that covered everything from romantic love to astronomy to medicine, the philosophers of ancient Greece, um, a va philosoph uh, Avic Avicenna, one of the, who was a noted scientist, pharmacist, um, a doctor in Persia in I believe the 14th century. Also his ideas were welcome to Timbuktu. It was an incredible collision of religious and secular ideas that lived really uh, coexisted side by side very openly in these universities and in, in these book collections that people amassed, uh, a, a time of great ferment. Um, so uh, what happened to these manuscripts? Um, they re it reached its peak in about 1590. Uh, in 1591, the Moroccans uh, invaded Timbuktu and they decim decimated the uh, defenders of the city. Uh, they captured many of the scholars, the scribes. They marched them in chains, or actually put them on camels and marched, uh, uh, took them by camel caravan in chains to Morocco, where they ended up as slaves. Timbuktu's golden era as a center of learning began to really decay and disintegrate at that point as also trade routes shifted that no longer was it seen as necessary to cross the desert. You had these sea routes. So all these forces came together in Timbuktu pretty quickly by the 17th century was, you know, well, the 17th, 18th century was pretty much lost. I mean, it was no longer this wealthy city. It was a back, became a backwater. Um, uh, what happened to the manuscripts is that after the glory days were over, the manuscripts began to disperse into the desert. They were passed down from family member to family member, big families in this part of the world. Twelve sons would inherit pieces of these libraries, move away. They would be distributed into the desert, onto, into villages along the Niger River. Um, then you had, so in addition to this dispersal of the great libraries of Timbuktu, you also had a couple of threats. You had a jihadi movement in the 19th century influenced by Malians or what was people from that area what, which became Mali who would go to south to Mecca and come back with a much more fundamentalist view of Islam. Um, so you had the, uh, a couple of jihadist movements that sprang up in the 1830s, 1850s. They did not like these books and they actually went after them and destroyed some. In the 1880s, 1890s, the French colonized the area. They went as far as Timbuktu captured the city in about 1894, uh, held the whole north until 1960, during this, until independence in 1960. During this time, uh, the French, French, arch, French ar archaeologists, French scholars, French soldiers went literally from house to house looking for these manuscripts, would seize them, take them back to Paris. So people became terrified. These were family heirlooms that had been passed down for generations. 
and they began to hide them. They hid them in the desert. They dug them. They dug, the, uh, they dug uh, pits for them in the middle of the Sahara. They built, they stuck them in storage rooms and built, literally built fake walls of mud to hide them. So by 1960, uh, when Mali reached its, uh, achieved its independence, these books were all but lost. I mean, there was a vestige of them in Timbuktu, but for the most part, they were gone. Abdel Qader Haidara was the figure behind this incredible renaissance. In 1984, uh, Haidara, who was the son of a scholar and had his own manuscript collection, dispersed again in several family houses throughout the desert, was hired by the government library, the Ahmed Baba Institute, which had been funded, started by, uh, supported by UNESCO to recover this lost heritage. He went out on the road, roads like this, uh, and became what's, what they call in Mali a prospecteur, a prospector. Literally, like the guys in 1849 California looking for alluvial deposits of gold, tracking down clues, this guy was out there tracking down, hey, I heard that there was a trunk full of 15th century manuscripts in village X in the middle of the Sahara. I heard there was a Quran from the 12th century uh, which had been imported from Egypt to Timbuktu uh, in a village uh, 100 miles from Timbuktu. He would set out ca on camels, on boats, and he would trek through landscapes like this, desolate, walking sometimes for days in this very parched environment, um, hated riding camels. Uh, so generally, if he joined a camel caravan, he would walk. because um, and, and just through this very desolate landscape, uh, managed to track down, sometimes would take uh, river boats down the Niger, this is a shot to the Niger at, at, in the eve, at night, and um, he succeeded miraculously in tracking down something like 100,000 manuscripts in the course of his 12 years of doing this. He created, he, he totally revitalized the Ahmed Baba Library, then he created his own library, he raised funds from all around the world, uh, from, uh, from the Middle East, from the United States, from Europe, it really had a snowball effect. So more and more money was pouring into Timbuktu. More and more people like Abdul Qadir Haider were finding their old family collections, turning them into building libraries to house them. So by 2006, when I arrived in the city, um, there were something like 35 or 40 libraries. Not all of them. You may think, I mean, some of these were mud huts with a bunch of, you know, 200 books in them. But some of them were remarkable edifices rising in this otherwise godforsaken town in the middle of the, at the edge of the Sahara. Abdul Qadir Hader Hydra built a beautiful library for himself. Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa, came to Timbuktu in 2000, early 2000s, and was so blown away by what he, by what he saw there that he donated, that he had the South African government donated $8 million to create a new Ahmed Baba Center, a beautiful new building rising in the middle of Timbuktu and how ended up housing 25 or 30,000 manuscripts. So you had this incredible uh, renaissance going on, which is what brought me there in the first place. And I was, you know, blown away by this stuff. I walked through; people were showing me trunks in their in their storage rooms, opening them up, and you know, I was holding in my hands these books from 500, 600 years ago. I mean, these were books that had not been well preserved, so the pages were fluttering apart in my hands, and 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 literally books disintegrating as I touched them. I was you know, maybe the first person to open these volumes in 500 years. It was that kind of a sense of discovery. This is, you know, the middle of Africa. Nobody, you know, un still undiscovered. So I was, I was entranced by this. Um, so this is where things were in 2006. This kind of, again, another shot of the Niger. Then the uh, next stage of the drama, this. This is a flag of the um, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Um, to make a long story short, 2000, around this, uh, based simultaneous with this cultural renaissance going on in Timbuktu, you had the beginnings of a jihadist movement happening in the desert. There had been a terrible war in Algeria in the 1990s, uh, a civil war between um, a, a, the, an Islamist movement and the military dictatorship. Uh, that created a wave of jihadism, of radicalism in Algeria, which is right next door to Mali. Those people then moved down after the war ended into Mali, which was a vast, unsecured desert, uh, and began kidnapping Westerners for, for ransom, uh, moving drugs across the desert, 
enriching themselves. By one account, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, as it became known in 2007, earned about $136 million from the, hot, from, uh, the seizure of European hostages. Um, European governments almost always paid. That was generally, which really put them at odds with the United States and Great Britain, which was very much, a, a very much against the idea of paying, uh, paying for money, uh, uh, money for hostages because, and this debate continues to this day, in fact, that money was used to recruit new jihadists, to buy weapons, to grow. And so by about 200, 2011, you had a, a, a burgeoning Islamist movement in the desert. But it still needed a spark, uh, something to kind of push it over the edge. The US was training Malian soldiers, but they were really not equipped to, essentially, this was a very poorly equipped, poorly trained, even despite US involvement and French involvement, they could not defend the country, and, and, and people knew it. But the idea behind, in the government was, well, the jihadists will never become powerful enough to really threaten, to the really threaten this, uh, the, the, gun, the government, the army. So we'll just leave things the way they are. Uh, so there was a blind spot about the growth of this movement. As I said, it needed a spark. The spark came in 2011 with the Arab Spring, um, Libya, uh, the third country after Tunisia and Egypt to, uh, uh, whose population rose up against the dictator. Uh, of course, we know what happened there. The U.S. and, and NATO forces got involved there. Uh, Barack Obama has said it was the biggest mistake, that uh, foreign policy mistake he's made is in not foreseeing and not uh, securing the country after the fall of Gaddafi. The place was in chaos. Arsenals opened up. Weapons were free for the taking. The Islamic jihadists drove across the desert in pickup trucks loaded up their trucks with weapon, heavy weaponry. At the same time, you had a secular Tuareg movement, these um, nomads in the desert of Mali who had always dreamed of creating their own homeland. They also drove, saw an opportunity here. They, uh, they, again, they, as well as the jihadists, packed their pickup trucks filled with weapons, drove across to Mali. At that point, you had an alliance uh, between the secular Tuaregs and the jihadis, all their guns, all their men together, and in the course of three months, they swept across the country, uh, the northern part of the country, and between January and April 2012, they had seized an area the size of France, or two-thirds of the country, declared a caliphate, instituted Sharia law, chopped off hands, destroyed shrines uh, uh, to Sufi saints, and began not overtly at first, but gradually to threaten the manuscripts, which were, of course, held to be anathema in their, co in the, in the, the co in, the, in their integration of secular ideas, in their celebration of music. One thing I forgot to mention, they had guidebooks to sex, guidebooks to better orgasm, which even included saying prayers to the prophet just before having sex with your wife. So this sort of stuff, you know, the idea of integrating you know, Islamic prayer and sex was something that the jihadists just found you know, blasphemous. And it was this kind of thinking, this kind of openness that made people feel, even if they're not overtly threatening these manuscripts, we've got to do something about it. So Hydera, the last third, as you know, as you've heard already, the last third of the book, well, I'd say 40% of the book, is the thriller that unfolds after the jihadists have taken over in this decision by Abdul Qadir Hydera and his small group of cohorts. This is a shrine. Sufi shrine that was destroyed by the jihadists. This was a couple, taken a couple of months later. So what happened, and these are, just gives you kind of an idea of the, I'm not going to go into details about this because I want you all to buy the book, but listen, <laughs> suffice it to say that a five-month elaborate operation unfolded uh, to safeguard these manuscripts. It was a three-step process that ultimately involved moving them by river and by road uh, for 550 miles to the safety of the South, uh, which was, remained under government control during this period of, of, of jihadism. Um, the story ends in, in, in January 2013 when the French army, which has uh, uh, engaged in Africa many times, as you probably know, in many different countries, from Rwanda to the Central African Republic, many of its former colonies and Francophone-speaking countries, uh, engaged in, Rwanda, in, in, uh, sorry, in, Ma in northern Mali this is some of the destruction caused by French warplanes uh, in, uh, in Timbuktu. Um, this is on the road to Timbuktu. This is a weapons truck uh, of Al-Qaeda that was targeted by 
uh, French missile and destroyed. Um, and uh, in, the, in a final spasm, this is, this is what the jihadists were capable of. This is what vindicated Abdel Qader for this incredible effort, again, which I'm not going to go into the details of. But let's suffice it to say that the final spasm of violence in this country was the targeting and destruction of every manuscript that remained behind in Timbuktu. This is the Ahmed Baba Institute in um, uh, the building that I mentioned was built by so the South African government. And I stumbled upon this guy sort of stare, staring uh, in disbelief at the, the remains of these 15th century manuscripts that had been gathered in the big pyre and doused with gasoline and set on fire. Um, and that was pretty much all that was left of some of the glorious works of uh, the golden age of Timbuktu. Um, and the story uh, pretty much, this, is, this kind of sums up where we are today in Timbuktu. These are um, UN forces peacekeepers. Um, I guess these guys are from, I believe they're from Burkina Faso. I encountered them about two years ago as I was traveling across the river uh, into Timbuktu to report on this story, on this uh, gather information on the jihadists and the rescue effort. Um, and th this, these guys are the thin blue helmeted line between um, the, uh, the jihadis who remain in the desert and, and Timbuktu. Their jihadists have been largely um, destroyed, but there are enough of them out there to uh, make things very insecure for the north and even down in the south. Of course, we know that we've seen over the last few months there have been attacks in Bamako, in Burkina Faso, in the, in the Ivory Coast. So this goes on. This is not necessarily a, I wish I could end my book with a, with a, an unambiguously happy ending, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, the situation is still unstable, uncertain, and, and really who knows how it's gonna end. Um, I'm gonna just give you, now, uh, you have the basic structure, now I'm gonna give you a little taste of, uh, of Abdul Qader and his um, manuscript, uh, so we'll see how much time we've got left. Yeah, so I'm gonna read a couple of, of sections that I think will give you a, a feeling for how this guy operated. Um, and I'm going to start with, um, let's see, this, is, this shows you how Hyderab, uh, it wasn't easy at first. Um, when he would go out into the, into the uh, desert and, or into these village, river, riverine villages and try to um, uh, negotiate for manuscripts, uh, people generally did not easily surrender their, uh, their, their heirlooms. They were um, suspicious of him. Who is this guy? Uh, uh, he, pr there had been prospectors before him. In fact, for 10 years, there had been an effort to gather these books. And they managed to find about 500 in the course of 10 years. I mean, people just locked them away. They did not want to give these books up. They didn't trust them. Anybody affiliated with the government, it reminded them of the French. You know, they just, they just clammed up. And so this is what Abdel Qader was running up against when he first went out on the road uh, and started looking around, following these clues, as I mentioned. Um, to track down these books for the, for the Ahmed Baba Library. But he was a, an operator, as I think that really word just kind of sums him up. Um, and he step by step figured out uh, how to um, negotiate, uh, how to value books, how to put people at ease. So this gives you a little sense here. This is one of his missions and how it worked out. People also sensed that Hydera was playing fair. After nearly being run out of Gorma Rarus, the first town he had visited, Haidara returned there a year later. On his first afternoon back in town, a Tuareg nomad in his 40s, a gaunt man in a ragged turban with half a dozen children playing around him in the sand, called out to him in greeting as he passed by his tent. Come inside, he cried. Haidara entered the traditional dwelling, stitched together from goat skins, and sat on the ground in the semi-darkness. He noticed a metal chest at the rear of the tent, the type normally used to hold manuscripts. You come from where, said the Tuareg. I'm from Timbuktu, replied Haider in Tamashek, the language of the Tuaregs. In addition to his native Songhoi, he was conversant in Peul and Tamashek, the two other main languages of Mali's north, as well as French, and thus had no problem negotiating with manuscript owners across the region. Hydera made small talk, and seeing that the Tuareg was too poor even to offer his visitor a cup of tea, he offered to purchase some food and drink for him and his family. Hydera ran out to the market and returned with half a slaughtered lamb and a kilogram bag of tea. The Tuareg grilled the lamb outside the tent, and as they sat eating in the sand with a man's family, Hydera gently broached the subject of manuscripts. I don't have any of those, the Tuareg said. 
I only have printed books. Can I take a look, asked Hydera. Why not? Hydera opened the trunk and poured through the volumes. Buried among the printed material was one work that caught his eye, a Quran from the 17th century. He looked through it carefully, noting the delicate Maghrebi letters, the fragile gilt that caught the late afternoon light filtering through the tent flap. It was, Hydera realized, a masterpiece. How much do you want for this, asked Hydera. Whatever you want to give me, the owner said, shrugging. You have to name your price. Give me 5,000 CFA, or about $10, the nomad said. It was a pitifully low sum. Hydera could not accept it. They bargained, but this time the buyer was bidding up the price. No, no, this treasure has huge value, he replied. 10,000 CFA. No, said Hydera. 20,000. Hydera gave him 100,000 CFA. The man received the money wide-eyed. If I've got more books like that, will you pay for them, he asked. Of course. At 5 o'clock the morning after that, in total darkness, Hydera heard a knock on his door. Who's that, Hydera said. The Tuareg entered his room carrying a large camel skin sack. Wordlessly, he dumped a pile of manuscripts on the ground. In the murkiness before dawn, Hydera could barely see what was lying there. But at 6 o'clock, golden light filtered through his window, illuminating magnificent treasure. When Hydera stepped outside the hut later that morning, he stared in astonishment. Tuaregs from across the region had formed a long line in front of his door, bearing camel and sheepskin sacks stuffed with manuscripts. Many had been hidden in caves or holes in the sand for decades. Hydera handed out the equivalent of thousands of dollars. Kuwait and, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia had subsidized the effort and left with more than 1,000 manuscripts. He had paid the sellers everything they had demanded and even more. He had taken everything they had. Hydra headed back up river to Timbuktu, his boat riding low in the water, weighed down with footlockers and piles of camel skin sacks. In Timbuktu, Mahmoud Zubair looked on with astonishment. You found all, that's the curator of the library. You found all that, he said. In his first year of work at the Ahmed Baba Institute, Hydra managed to acquire as many manuscripts as the previous team of eight prospectors had collected in a decade. So Hydra's reputation spread, as I said, by 2000, uh, 1996, after 12 years of doing this, he had collected you know, 100,000 manuscripts or more and started this, uh, essentially, this renaissance in the city. Um, that year, he began to, well, he wanted to settle down. He was getting older. He, found a, 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 a woman who he was wooing, um, was tired of these outrageous trips through the desert and, 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 and away for four weeks at a time. And so he decided to embark on a new stage of his life. And um, I want to read a little bit about how that played out, because um, it also gives you a little indication on when I use the word operator, I use it in, in, um, in many ways uh, to describe him. Um, he was... Um, uh, so Hyder wanted to create a private library, but he, he was having real difficulty finding money to do this. Uh, he wrote to 100 different uh, foundations across the world, got nowhere, because he didn't have a catalog. People wanted to see a catalog. He didn't have anything. He, he ha didn't even know what he had. He had something in his private collection, like 55,000 manuscripts, but he could catalog probably 100 of them. So you know, people weren't interested in this. They had no idea what they were getting. They weren't going to subsidize it. Um, so the Libyans, Gaddafi got interested, but he didn't want to deal with Gaddafi. Uh, and then the deus ex machina came uh, with Henry Louis Gates, the um, Harvard professor, and uh, 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 who has, of course, popularized the idea that um, African, the Af Africans produce great works of literature, and this should be celebrated. This kind of has become you know, one of the main uh, missions of his life, is to popularize and identify uh, and preserve this learning tradition of learning that's been you know, pretty much forgotten um, over the course of the centuries. So hi, uh, Henry Louis Gates uh, is out to make a documentary about Timbuktu. And uh, he arrives in the city. And this is what happens next. OK. Um, when they reach their hotel, so, uh, OK. So they get to the they get to Timbuktu. When they reach their hotel, and and, and and sorry, Gates has this idea that he doesn't know anything about Abdul Qadir Haider. He's got this idea he's going to go to the mosque. He's going to take pictures of the you know shoot some footage of the mosques, talk to the librarians there. Then he finds out about Haider. But when they reach their hotel, their translator guide, an acquaintance of Haider, approached them with a different proposal. 
if you want to see a real library, he said, these books are held mostly in private hands, and there is a man I know who might be willing to show you his collection. Gates, intrigued, changed his itinerary, and he and his film crew followed his guide through the back alleys to Hydra's house. Hydra, meanwhile, was growing despondent. The library he had dreamed of creating for five years was going nowhere. More than 100 foundations had turned down his proposal, and he had run out of ideas. A big delegation of Americans is here in Timbuktu, Gates' guide informed Hydra on the morning of the Harvard professor's arrival. They want to visit you. They want to see your manuscript, so be ready. Hydra sensed that the visit could be an opportunity for him. Fine, he replied. I'll prepare something for them. Hydra laid down a carpet and gathered the best manuscripts in his Timbuktu collection. Gates and the film crew arrived later that day. As the crew filmed, Gates leafed through a treatise on astronomy, a ledger book that recorded slave transactions and other works. These are books written by black people, Gates asked Hydra in a scene captured on camera. Hydra, a bushy-haired and youthful 33-year-old, nods. When I was growing up, Gates replies, shaking his head in amazement, the school books said that Africans couldn't read and write and didn't have books. For hours, Hydra gave Gates a tutorial on Timbuktu's literary heritage, describing the rise of the University of Sankare and its illustrious roster of biographers, jurists, and historians, enumerating the 12 important families that, accumul that had accumulated most of Timbuktu's manuscripts during its golden age, chronicling the invasion by Morocco that drove most of these volumes underground, and explaining the role played by descendants of Timbuktu's collectors who had protected the works for 400 years. It was one of the most moving days of my life, Gates recalled. I was so emotional holding these books in my hands. Not a word was spoken about Hydra's stymied plans to build a library, but Gates left his encounter convinced he had to do something to preserve the manuscripts. Unprotected in neglected storage rooms, many were turning to dust or being devoured by termites, and some had already been lost. It was a bone-dry climate in Timbuktu, so he was lucky, Gates said. If they'd been stored in the humidity of Nigeria, he would have, they would have turned to mush long ago. When he returned to the United States, Gates informed the project director of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in New York City of the amazing discovery he had made in Timbuktu. All of these books still exist. This guy has them, and they're not even in a library, he said. Three months later, on the strength of Gates's recommendation, the Mellon Foundation awarded Hydra a grant of nearly $100,000 for the creation of a new manuscript center in Timbuktu. The money came with strings attached. Mellon required the collector to create a digital archive before moving ahead with the physical construction. I know you want to build a library, but the cataloging and digitization have to come first, Gates emphasized. Hydra expressed his gratitude. Then he hired an architect and construction crew and built the library anyway. <laughs> what, Gates said, when Hydra informed him several months later that the library was complete. I told you that you needed to catalog first. We can't do that without first having a building, Hydra replied. He argued that the manuscripts had been exposed to the elements and imperiled in their dusty storage rooms, and that his first priority was to protect them. Exasperated and fearing a scandal, Gates reported the misuse of the grant money to the Mellon Foundation. They grumbled about it, but the attitude, says Gates, was what's done is done. A few months later, Hydra again called Gates at Harvard. What is it, asked Gates, still annoyed by Hydra's high-handedness. I need another grant to build another library, Hydra said. What? Gates exclaimed once more. It's amazing that you got a grant to begin with. I know, Hydra said, but there was a slight miscalculation. What are you talking about? We built it in the floodplain. We have to rebuild it. As Hydra explained it, after many years of little or no rainfall in Timbuktu, he and his construction team had taken for granted that the building site was secure. But that year, a once-in-a-generation series of rainstorms had struck the region. Rainwater had deluged the rooms, cracked the cement, and caused the roof to collapse. Everything is filled with water, he told Gates. Luckily, Hydra hadn't yet started moving his manuscripts into the new library, and they had all been spared. Gates, mortified, went back to the Mellon Foundation. You remember that library in Timbuktu that was built without your authorization, with your money, he asked the program direct officer. Yes, he replied. Well, we've got to build it again. The program director just laughed. The whole situation was so absurd, said Gates, and Hydra's demand for more money so audacious that it evoked more amusement than outrage. The Mellon Foundation decided to come through with the extra funding, and the Ford Foundation contributed money as well. A new building soon rose on the site, this one built with reinforced concrete and with its foundation raised several feet off the ground. On January 13, 2000, in a ceremony attended by many luminaries, 
the Mama Hydra Commemorative Library, officially opened its doors to the world. So this, of course, began uh, between the Ahmed Baba Institute and the Hydra Library. These were basically formed the linchpins of what became this incredible um, outpouring of, uh, of culture and preservation and libraries built across the city at the same time you had, uh, I mean, you had, you had radio, when I was there in 2006, radio reporters from Germany and archivists from, Nepal, uh, from, uh, from Amsterdam and um, uh, a team of imams from Morocco. Everybody was descending on the city and you also had this uh, outpouring, simultaneous outpouring of a music revolution going on in the city, which music forms a part of this book as well because music is part of this extraordinary Malian culture. So you had the, this, this, these uh, uh, foreigners coming from around the world to this concert series, what became known as the African Woodstock in the desert, uh, that was going on, creating this, 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 this confluence of activity, uh, tourist-friendly uh, 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 activity as a music and culture. In the background, of course, you have Al-Qaeda murmuring, slowly growing, 2006, 2007, 2008. And then, of course, you have this cataclysm in 2011, 2012. And I think I'm going to end it there rather than begin to read details of the rescue operation. Um, but this is where I just found it. What I try to do is kind of show these, these twin, the, all, all, really this, this simultaneous um, develop, these two very uh, uh, polarizing and polarized developments going on simultaneously in Timbuktu, the uh, growth of this incredible culture, and at the same time, the rise of jihad that all came together in 2012 with this cataclysmic result. I'm going to break off there, and I'm, I'm happy to take um, questions from the crowd. Um, and we'll put it on the, let's see, on the whoops. I wanted to find my book to leave it there. There we go. So um, can I ask, answer any questions from the audience about, uh, yes? Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to tell you that, meant to say that. Please go to the mics. Uh, in, in, uh, in the face of all of these threats, how much um, has been captured or discovered about the manuscript? How much has been preserved, you mean? or, or? Well, what, is, what, what are they? Do you, uh, they? Have they been digitized? Yeah, the, OK. I would, the digitization question is a very good one, and it's, uh, there's a great deal of disorganization uh, among these librarians. Who, as you see, Abdul Qadr's priority when he got this money was, you know, digitization? What? I want a building. And this is the way that, uh, you know, people in, in Timbuktu measure their, uh, their, their worth, their influence, their importance. So um, priority was never on digitization. I would say that the Ahmed Baba Institute with the uh, the government library, which had a very, a very um, close involvement of a lot of foreign, uh, foreign librarians and, and foreign restore, book restorers, people from uh, uh, France and from uh, Norway and South Africa, as I said, uh, em emphasized digitization. So that was going on. I think it might even be true that the entire Abin Baba library, which consists of well over 100,000 volumes, I believe, has been fully digitized. As far as the other work, it's an ongoing process. I just read a very interesting piece in The Economist a couple of months ago about a, an effort going on between a monk uh, in, in Minnesota, of all places, who became fast, has worked on manuscript preservation in, in Syria, in homes in Aleppo, long before the Civil War broke out there, and actually, thank goodness, preserved a lot of that manuscript tradition, who became fascinated by Hyder's story and has made several trips now to Timbuk to Bamako, where, the capital, uh, meeting with Hydra, there may may even have begun the digitization process um, of the Mama Hydra collection and even the greater, uh, you know, even other collections that are all now amassed in storage rooms in Bamako. Um, but it's you know it requires a lot of money. The books are not well kept now; they're all stashed in trunks. That they're not back in their libraries yet. So I, I I believe that the vast majority of them are still not cataloged, uh, at least. Uh, at least online, um, there may be scribbling, scribblings in notebooks about what they've got. I, the guys, as they were packing the manuscripts for smuggling out of the city, kept had to keep track because they were they were throwing in books from a lot of different libraries, and you know had to keep. So it was really the the, the peril that they were under that finally forced Abdul Qadir Haider and his cohorts to do exactly what Gates and the Mellon Foundation had demanded back in uh, in 2000 uh, that he categorize and 
catalog and digitize. But it's going to be a long process, 350,000 plus manuscripts. Anyone else? Yes? Can you hear me or should I get up? I think you should get up. Okay. There seems to be the protocol. So it sounds like he was able, I'm a librarian, uh -huh. and I'm going to take the unpopular position that he was right, and that it's more important to preserve your original materials first than it is to digitize them. Uh, it, it, for a rant I won't bother to get into. But it sounds like he was able to initially build his, his facility for $100,000. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you're able to, I mean, is it the economy? Is it Labor's construction cheap. costs? Labor's pretty okay. Cheap. Yeah, okay. it's northern Africa. It's one of the poorest countries on the planet. It's, you know, a bunch of brick. I mean, bricks, mud, uh, make some rooms, electricity. Uh, gets climate control obviously requires... Uh, the, I mean, let, let's not get this wrong. I've, I saw the, the final result, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, lime, he, actually didn't, he actually built a lot of it with limestone. So, uh, but $100,000 goes a long way in that part of the world. Okay, yeah. okay. And, and I guess I, I was wondering specifically about the environmental conditions and climate control and how well things really are going to be yeah, preserved climate, in that facility? Yeah, works both ways there. Okay. You, you know, as Henry Louis Gates said, the, the Nigeria, this would have, you would have had fun, rot and fungus and water damage, whatever. But, you know, the dry climate, which is where the manuscripts were originally produced, uh, didn't seem to be too great either. I mean, I, I saw mm -hmm. some of these, as I mentioned, opening these books that have been sitting in uh, these storage rooms in these boxes for centuries and having these things just, you know, there was a lot of rot there. I mean, things would become illegible mm -hmm. from maybe water had soaked in from somewhere, but, you know, or they had just crumbled into dust. The termites were a really big problem. So, uh, and there was a scene in the book which where, where Abdel Qadir uh, finally talks to this guy after four days of, of persuasion, gets this guy to open up this trunk that he hears his wonderful stuff and he opens it up, and there's like nothing. There's just swarms of termites, and no manuscripts left. He hasn't, he hadn't even opened the book in the, the 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 chest in 20 years, and the guy breaks down into tears, you know. So, uh, so obviously Timbuktu had its own problems, but probably had it been in Bamako or you know, uh, sub, uh, subtropical area, tropical area would have they would have all been destroyed. I'm just curious, uh, you had mentioned some of the content of some of these manuscripts, and one can see why the fundamentalists at that point would not be in favor of them. But others, like just the, the Koran, what is their problem with No, that? I don't, don't think they have a problem with the Koran, uh, or the Hadith, or many, many of these works, you're right, they're Islamic, uh, they're Islamic works. Uh, they're, they shouldn't have a problem with, it at all, with them at all. In fact, let's face it, I mean, there was no, um, uh, you'll see in the New York Times, book review next Sunday that uh, um, Ben McIntyre, uh, celebrated Ben McIntyre, who I was happy to see reviewing my book. But he did raise the issue of just exactly how overt the threat was. Um, and let's, it is true that many of these books were religious volumes um, and, that the managed, and that the jihadists were aware that, these, that other books existed and never really moved against them. Um, but uh, in fact, there were moments where people were caught trying to take out the books and were ordered, were you know, threatened with uh, amputation, with theft, and ordered to return to Timbuktu. So the jihadists knew about these books. They wanted to keep them in Timbuktu. They didn't want to keep them in Timbuktu, for, I think, for good reasons. They didn't want to build li you know, new libraries and museums. They wanted them as, as probably as hostages, should something go wrong. You know, they could use them for political, uh, for political pressure. Um, they knew that UNESCO was behind this, and that UNESCO value, UNESCO equals West, equals France. And we did see that in the last days of the war, what was the thing that they knew would be the most heinous, you know, hateful thing they could do to really slap, you know, stick it to the West, burn, the manus burn whatever manuscripts they could find. So, um, yeah, I would argue that you know, they didn't immediately target them like they did the shrines where they just went after them with hammers and destroyed these Sufi shrines. Everyone they could find just knocked to the ground. So it was a little more subtle, but, um, but Haider perceived a, a danger. And um, as he says, you know, I'm not 100% certain what would have happened had we hadn't removed them. But um, I definitely think that many, many more would have ended up like those uh, in, in, in the ashes of the Ahmed Baba Institute. So I think that what happened at the very end vindicated his belief that they were in danger 
although you're right, many of them were non-secular books that the Islamists should have had no problem with. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, hey Josh. Um, I apologize if you covered this before I arrived, but I was wondering if you could describe the, the reporting that, that brought you to the story a little bit. When you, you went there in, in 2006 yeah. to, to cover the jihadi uprising. No, not in 2006. There was nothing really going on oh, there. Oh, okay. I didn't even know. I never All right. They were there, actually, but it didn't register at the time. Didn't hear about jihad. I mean, it was, a very early, it was very early on. It was like the next year, 2007, that they officially joined, became known as al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So this wasn't even an issue. So, so what, what brought you to this story? Did you go there specifically to, to cover this? Back in 06? Yeah. Yeah, I, I said I was scrambling. I had left Newsweek after like 18 years as a foreign correspondent. I was you know, just trying to, trying to make a living in this new uh, thing I wanted to try out and uh, write longer narrative nonfiction. And um, this, because of my previous visit to Timbuktu, I, I was entranced by the place. And this seemed like a very a cool way to get back to Timbuktu, because I saw a small article about the manuscripts. And so Smithsonian loved the idea. And I went. And you know, it was pretty early on. The man, there had been some press, but not a lot. Abdul Qadir certainly was not a, I mean, he's really well known now. There have been articles in the National Geographic. And I've written a few. And you know, others have written about him. But in those days, he was barely known. You know, So I was one of the early visitors to Timbuktu to, to write about this. Uh, this flowering in the desert. And then that interest kind of stayed with me because Timbuktu is a fascinating place, although it's not much to look at, I admit. Yeah. Yes. You want to come down and use the. I can't, I can't walk down. Okay. So, how did you first flex your fingers over the keyboard? How long did it take to produce a, like a final draft of the book? Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to really say when the book, be, because the book began, you know, in two, I mean, there was material from 2000 over my many visits that were integrated into the story. Uh, I made a major trip there in 2000, early 2014, where I spent a month there focusing <coughs> specifically on the jihadists and meeting Abdul Qadir for a long, long, a series of meetings, like 14 hours together to get his full story. And then I came back and I started writing in like 2000, mid 2014 for about five months, rewrites, you know, back and forth, maybe another. Uh, it wasn't until like the spring of 2015 that I, I had something that I was you know, really happy with. So I guess a year, you know, a year starts, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. Uh, oh, thanks. I was lucky enough to visit Timbuktu in 2010. Great. Yeah, um, just at the, yeah, and start, things were starting to get. Things were getting a little dicey a little then. Dicey. It was just about um, uh, two weeks after they canceled or removed, changed the location of the exactly. Woodstock in the exactly. desert. They moved it into, into, it was out in the dunes about 40 miles west of Timbuktu, and it was in incredible place. It was an old Tuareg uh, gathering spot in the desert and amazing dunes, but it became too difficult to secure. So in 2010, when you visited, the promoter of the festival, who is a, a character in my book, moved it within the municipal boundaries of Timbuktu so it could be better protected. Yeah. I um, uh, f formally taught um, African history, so I was very interested in everything you said about the historical uh -huh. dimensions of all of this. And uh, I, I remember seeing, I have pictures of the, uh, the Ahmed Babbitt Institute, that beautiful wooden um, facade, the yeah. front door. Is, Doorway, yeah, exactly. Is that where, uh, that's a separate library from the second and third ones you were talking about? Yeah, that one was the original, you probably, in 2010, right. Yeah, that, there, there, there were two libraries. There was the original one, probably the one you saw, which was built in the 70s, um, which had kind of Moroccan art. I mean, it was, it's a smaller building, and that was where... Uh, wooden, wooden yeah, doors. I yeah, and then, yeah. And then in, in 2008 or 2009, after the South Africans came, they constructed this kind of monolithic, you know, fake mud-walled structure. It, it's a, some people don't like it. Some people think it is. It pays homage to the... Uh, architecture of the region, um, but it's a, it's a colossus. Yeah, so I don't think that's the one. You, and that's the one that the well, the jihadis seized that building in April 2012 when they invaded, turned it into a military barracks, and that's why this damage was done because because the Abdul Qadir Haider and his librarians couldn't get inside that building and protect and move out the manuscripts because it had already been occupied by the jihadis. So that's why they lost those. 
several thousand. When that happened, uh, yeah. two, years after, two years after my visit, I was struck by um, how lucky, in the sense that they didn't get more centralization, they would have been more easily taken over sure. had, had, the, had all these manuscripts been centralized more effectively. They were actually in the process of moving the entire collection into the big building, and they were going to turn that other, the former Ahmed Bob Institute into like a, a school or something. Um, mm -hmm. But they hadn't gotten around to it, so fortunately, so they were lucky. Yeah. yeah, they were lucky in that regard. And Thank also, there were like fifteen thousand down in the basement behind a locked door in the in the new building that jihadis never knew about. So those were all safe too. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it seems like for the librarian, and I'm I can't remember how to say his name, but it seems like it would it really re requires some personal passion to to save these manuscripts and to do the work that's required. And I wondered if you could talk briefly, um, without giving away too much, so we'll read your book, um, about his personal story and what personally motivated him to do this. Sure. So he was, uh, he came from a family, it wasn't one of the sort of noble families of Timbuktu, but it was a family that had long valued learning. Um, his his, that there had been a, a collection of manuscripts in the family for several centuries. His father was kind of a self-taught scholar who became a qadi, a, a judge, traditional Islamic judge. These are the people who, uh, in every village, preside over marriages and divorces and civil civil you know, disputes. Um, so, and then when his father died in the in the eighty in the early eighties, he appointed Abdul Qadir, who was only seventeen, as the the kind of the custodian of the private collection. So, and Abdul Qadir was always the most studious one. He had, I think, 11 brothers and sisters, but he was the studious one. He learned Arabic so he could read the books. He was always really interested. His father ran a Quranic school in the house, so Abdul Qadir was the young, one of the younger members of the family, and he was hanging around. His father would bring out these manuscripts when he was a kid and share them with the students. And so he was um, brought up with these things in the family, and then and then he, was, um, he became the custodian of this collection because his father left it to him in the will, even though he was kind of reluctant about it. He was only 17. And that role then led the custodian of the Ahmed Baba Institute uh, when he was really interested in ramping up the collection after the failures of these prospectors to really build the collection. He turned to Abdul Qadir. He just had this sense that Abdul Qadir was the kind of guy who could do this, enterprising young man. And Abdul Qadir was reluctant. His father was also a businessman, had made a lot of money uh, trading grain and cattle. And that's kind of the way Abdul Qadir saw his future. He, wanted, he said to me, I wanted to make money. I didn't want to work for a library or, you know. And the, but they, the custodian, the curator prevailed upon him to try this out, to start. And he got swept up in the, I guess, in the quest, you know. And, uh, um, the freedom, and it was pretty well paid, I think, as well. So he, he just enjoyed, yeah, and then he, but most of all, he became, he was, became really more and more passionate about the manuscripts, and he became an expert in, in, in the, uh, in, in what was, you know, in, in, in um, the history of the region. He could just talk for hours, you know, endless hours about what was in those manuscripts. And um, as somebody who worked with him very closely said, um, he treasures them uh, you know, even more than he treasures his own children. You know? I mean, in fact, his family was quite um, uh, hurt, I think, that he really pretty much, when this, when this smuggling operation was under, underway, Abu Qadr basically tuned out the family. He was just focused on saving these books. So that caused no small amount of tension. Anyone else? Yeah. I was in Timbuktu in 2008 and saw many of these manuscripts. Yeah. They were in horrible condition. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> building a library is great. It's certainly a first start. Mm -hmm. But it occurs to me that somebody, and I, what I want to know is where this is going, needs to go in, prioritize the important ones, and start um, <clears throat> preserving them. Is any of that being done? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I said the, I think the Ahmed Baba Institute was, that stuff was all well underway when you were there. Did you visit that government library? Because they were using acid-free paper and they were digitizing and they had this Japanese kit, kit, kitikata um, 
paper, I mentioned that in the book, that kind of preserves. But since Al Qaeda came in, is that? Well, I since Al Qaeda, I think you know all the no. I mean, all that all that work pretty much stopped. Yeah. And any chance that it's going to start again? I think they have to get them out of these. They're basically just. I look. I have not been back to Bamako in two years, so I'm not exactly sure whether there's any. Uh, you know, what's going on. Um, I, I have heard things secondhand, um, but it doesn't seem like there's a hell of a lot happening. Uh, it seems like most of these manuscripts are sitting in these storage rooms. Um, Deteriorating further. Well, you know, they're supposed to be, there's money, money was given by the Western, by Western donors to preserve, to create these cultural, uh, these uh, climate controlled uh, conditions so that they wouldn't disintegrate further. But, um, you know, they're basically just stack, you know, stacks of, chests, one on top of the other. It's hard to do anything with them when they're all. So the idea is to get them back to the libraries. And the lab, they have, you know, a couple of them have these fairly extensive laboratories and conservation, preservation rooms. Uh, you, you, they kind of need to get them out of these, of these basements, storage facilities. And is there an initiative to fund this? Everybody just perceives the, look, there have been terrorist attacks in the region. For the, I mean, foreigners are being killed, you know. So, in Bamako and Burkina Faso, targeted in, in, so it's not a great time for manuscript preservation on efforts. There's no festival in the desert has been canceled for four years running. It's really moribund up there. Yeah, not a great time. Anyone else? I think that does it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank great. you very much. Thank you so much. Great. And yeah. book sales in the, in the shop. Now you can find out what really happened. <laughs> um, I don't want to, I want to take out the USB stick, but I don't want to, I want to eject it properly. So you want to just yank it? Okay. Whatever. All right. Whatever. They always say you're not supposed to do that, but it never really does any, any damage. Good.